This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Um, my name is Ray Fouché. I'm the 2009-2010 Center for Advanced Study Resident Fellow, and I'm leading the initiative entitled Interpreting Technoscience, Explorations in Identity, Culture, and Democracy. And this afternoon, it's with great pleasure, I, we have Simon Cole here to give us a lecture. Simon Cole is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society at the, at the University of California at Irvine. Um, he's done amazing work, and that's part of the reason I'm really excited that he's here. Um, his first book he published was entitled Suspect Identities, a History of Fingerprints um, and Criminal Identification, published by Harvard University Press. And Suspect Identities received a great deal of press because of its innovative and interesting interpretation of the meaning and use of fingerprints historically and contemporarily. Um, um, it won um, the Rachel Carson Prize for the, from the Social Studies of Science Society um, and has been tremendously well received. Um, most recently, he has published the book Truth Machine, the contentious history of DNA fingerprinting um, from, the, from the University of Chicago Press. Um, and it raises some of the same questions about what it means to use scientific and technological evidence for the production of, um, um, for the, well, for, and for its implications for, for legal decisions. Um, he's received grants from the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health. He's presented his papers and um, work around the world. Um, but some of the things I'm most interested and excited about are his connections between the academic world and the world and society. He has written articles for the New York Times, New York Times Magazine, the Los Angeles Times, and um, um, most importantly for, well, I, sh I should say most importantly, but more interestingly for um, Lingua Franca, um, the, the, the demise of Lingua Franca. Um, so he has done amazing works, and um, I'm just really glad to have um, Professor Cole here to, to give us a lecture. Um, so this afternoon he'll be talking with the title of Forensic Reality, CSI, Media, and Public Technoscience. So can we please welcome Professor Cole. Well, thanks so much, Ray, for that um, very generous introduction. Uh, I'm very honored to have been invited here to uh, talk to you for this theme uh, on technoscience and to be invited here by my old friend, Professor Ray Fouché. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard about something called the CSI effect. You probably have heard about it in, in numerous places uh, through media, on the web, and TV, magazines. You may have seen uh, the cover of US News and World Report. You may have seen uh, t uh, television shows like uh, uh, television reports on your nightly news like the one cited here, or even read about it in uh, mainstream and respectable scientific magazines like Scientific American, National Geographic, and so on. Uh, in fact, you could say that everybody's talking about the CSI effect. Uh, Supreme Court justices are mentioning it in their uh, published opinions. Uh, senators, senators, congressmen throughout the land are talking about the CSI effect. Um, Patrick Leahy talked about it in a recent hearing, and so did, uh, he's chair, of course, of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, and so did the minority leader, Jeff Sessions of Alabama, mentioned the CSI effect as well. So uh, maybe this is just because I work in forensic science, but I imagine that all of you as well are also hearing about this all, all the time. You're, there are now books out about this, uh, ranging from kind of popular true crime books to academic cultural studies -y type books. This, this is a book called Reading CSI um, by a lot of uh, media and communications uh, critics. Uh, there are 
probably between five and 10 graduate students doing dissertations on some aspect of the CSI effect. The prosecutor, county prosecutor of Maricopa County, which is the county that contains Phoenix, Arizona, has issued a report on the CSI effect calling for uh, there to be a disclaimer on the show. When the show comes on, there should be text that comes on and says this is a fictional television program. And the media that talks about this effect sometimes conveys a real sense of crisis, that this is not just entertainment news, that this is something quite serious. Um, here's one report that suggests that, uh, that this is causing hung juries and causing the acquittal of obviously guilty, guilty uh, uh, criminals. Here's a report that says the CSI effect is real and profound. And here's one that says it's polluting jury pools and uh, making it impossible for prosecutors to prosecute crimes. Uh, here's a brief report of um, the growth of the term. The term was unheard of before 2002. First appears in Time Magazine and then in the Oregon newspaper, The Oregonian. In 2002, you get a couple of reports and then it starts shooting up in 2005, 2006. It's, uh, two, the year 2000 is when CSI first goes, goes on the air. Now, uh, what I'm gonna talk about here, I'm not gonna talk about the television show CSI. Uh, I'm not interested in the show, I don't like the show. Um, <laughs> and I find it boring to watch uh, the, the little that I watch it. There are uh, lots of academics, uh, lots of academic work out there that you can read that offers critiques and literary interpretations of the show. Uh, my topic is not really gonna be whether the CSI effect is actually happening, although I am gonna talk about that a little bit and I have uh, written some, some, some work about it and there is other academic work about this, but what I'm really gonna try to talk about today is a study of the media talk about the CSI effect. In other words, what does it mean that people are talking about the CSI effect? What, what, what are they really talking about? Uh, and, and most of this will, is based on a reading of, um, of a, a close reading of more than 100 of what will eventually be 400 media sources about C the CSI effect. And what does this tell us about the use of science in the law in the 21st century? So uh, to, to frame this, I wanna just say a little bit about the way I think about science, uh, the institutions that we call science and law. And uh, one way of, of looking at this is that, and, and what makes it interesting to look at the relationship between them, is to note that science and law are both social institutions that claim to produce something called truth. And in that sense, they are both cooperators and rivals at the same time. There are uh, occasions when the pr uh, truth produced by scientific institutions may conflict with the truth as produced by legal institutions, or vice versa, or there may be times when they work together to um, co-produce, as the jargon goes, uh, truth. So, uh, and, and, and yet, and probably they are, in contemporary society at least, among the most important institutions for producing truth. We tend to uh, 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 give deference to, tr to truths that come with the label science. And to, I think, a lesser extent, we give some deference to truths that come with the, the label of, of law. Uh, now, the popular image of, um, of, of science, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what my view of, of science is. Um, there's, there's often a popular image out there that, well, science is, some, is, uh, is, is work that follows uh, something called the scientific method, that science is knowledge that is absolutely certain and irrefutable. Uh, and Social scientists trained in the field of science and technology studies, like both Professor Fouché and I were, um, 
don't entirely agree with that. Um, we would argue that there's not really a single method called the scientific method that is used by everyone that we want to call a scientist. There is a kind of a, a mythical scientific method involving experiments, um, but there are people like Charles Darwin, who we would certainly think of as a scientist, who didn't necessarily use um, the experimental method in, in that sense. Uh, and so I would have a kind of looser definition of science um, that has something to do with using theory and data to learn about the natural world. Um, and I would suggest that science is, rather than being characterized by claims of certain knowledge, is in fact uh, a lot of what we call science today consists of trying to characterize and understand and draw limits around uncertainty rather than certainty. Um, uh, the, the mark of something that's called science is, is as likely to be the clarity with which you talk about the uncertainty of the claims you want to make rather than, uh, than how, how certain, uh, what degree of certainty you, uh, with what degree of certainty you express your claims. Um, and so the, this view is, is somewhat at odds with, um, I think, what exists uh, among a lot of lay people in their view of what science is. So having, having done that, a lot of uh, people who look at science and law have talked about kind of well-known differences between science and law as truth-generating institutions. Science, it is said, is an open-ended inquiry. It does not come with inherent time limits. The scientific enterprise can continue as we learn more and more about the phenomenon that we want to study. Uh, and we never have to necessarily uh, bring the inquiry to an end. Our knowledge is is always provisional and it's always open to being revised by new findings. Now that's um, not entirely true if you think of climate change. Um, yes, we have an open-ended inquiry, but on the other hand, uh, we, there's, there's some point at which uh, inquiry needs to stop and action might need to be taken. Um, but science itself as an institution doesn't put a time limit on things. It's precisely the opposite in the law. You have a time-limited uh, inquiry into the truth. Um, uh, but it can't go on forever. It has to come to an end at some time. And once, it's, uh, once it does come to an end, the law wants to move on. It does not want to revisit uh, old questions that, that it, it already viewed. Um, science can express its findings in continuous or probabilistic terms. Um, law tends not to. We don't tend to have a legal proceeding and decide, well, we think it's 95% likely that the defendant is guilty, and what do we do then? Do we put them in prison? Do we not put them in prison? Um, no, we have to make a decision. Do we think this person is guilty or not, beyond a reasonable doubt? And once we make that decision, we act as if it's true. So once a jury has decided, yes, beyond a reasonable doubt, they think this person is guilty, they become guilty and are treated as such. They're not uh, punished only 95% of the amount that they should be punished. Um, and there are interesting questions that I think I won't talk about explicitly, but that uh, 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 sort of will be an undercurrent in what I'm gonna talk about in that um, I think there's a difficulty for law in dealing with the probabilistic nature of, of knowledge. I think it's, it's hard in, in law to make decisions to decide to punish a person or to not punish a person or to award money to a person or to not award money to a person. If you, under, if, if you understand that your decision is probabilistic in nature and might not be correct. Uh, it's much easier to assume that once you've made a decision, uh, you're going to treat it as correct. Uh, people also note that uh, among the, the many tensions between science and law, um, perhaps the most frequently cited one is the scientific illiteracy or innumeracy among legal actors. Um, you'll often hear jo uh, jokes about um, Judges and lawyers are people who wanted to make money but weren't good at science, and so they went to law school. Um, and and uh, you, you hear that all the time, and, and there probably is some truth to it. There is no scientific training that's necessary to be a lawyer or a judge in this country uh, still today, and yet scientific issues, uh, very difficult issues involving mathematics and statistics and probability and causation are 
uh, are entering into the courts more and more, uh, and, and here we have uh, judges and lawyers that may not have any scientific training at all. There's some policy attempts to backfill this by offering training seminars um, uh, for judges, but this is of limited effectiveness to take um, professionals who've been doing something for decades and try to give them a crash course in statistical reasoning and, and things of that nature. Um, so there is a sense that there is uh, not enough uh, scientific literacy among legal actors. Uh, that's, that is a two-way street. It's also sometimes said that, um, that scientists are ignorant of law, but that's considered to be a less serious problem. Um, and uh, this is kind of a, a smaller version of a larger problem that's called the deficit model of public understanding, the notion that people, don't, people in society today don't know enough science, they don't understand enough science, um, and if in a democracy you want people to make decisions about things like climate change or where to put nuclear power plants or whether to have nuclear power plants um, or whether to take the flu vaccine, um, any of these questions that uh, it's a problem if people don't have a good understanding of science. Now the CSI effect is going to be kind of a strange thing because as we're gonna see, it actually is the opposite effect. It sort of posits that it's a big problem for society that people know too much about science, not too little. So now finally uh, people are, are learning about science and now we're being told it's too much science. So I, I use this term hyperscientia, meaning knowing too much science, which is a play on a term hyperlexis, which is used by some law professors to describe the phenomenon of having too much law. The United States is supposed to be a country with too much law um, and now we have too much science as well. So um, as background to the CSI effect, I want to emphasize that um, this, this supposed effect is happening on top of, uh, of real changes. Uh, forensic science doesn't really just go back to 1900. It goes back even further um, in terms of toxicology and poisoning cases. But uh, it begins to, to really develop uh, uh, around the turn of the century, more techniques become available. And at the turn of the 19th century, uh, legal thinkers were very excited about forensic science. They said, we're gonna, we're gonna bring in science into the courtroom and we're, it's not gonna be like it has been where we have character witnesses who, uh, who, we have witnesses coming in and saying the exact opposite thing and telling conflicting stories and the jury has to decide which one, who, which one to believe. Science is going to come in and give us definitive truth. And uh, if, if you look at the sort of Sci uh, legal thought at that time, um, this is expressed both with hope and with some trepidation because on the one hand, uh, legal thinkers were excited to not have to deal with the kind of ambiguity of truth that was existing in the law and to have science kind of cut right through and produce an unambiguous version of truth. But on the other hand, they might were a little worried about it that science would take over their function, that who, who needs law, um, who needs legal institutions if science can produce answers uh, about uh, criminal cases and, and other cases. And you can see that sort of in the contrasting reception of fingerprints, which were, was embraced by the law um, as producing a definitive answer to whether a person touched a particular object, and the lie detector, which was rejected uh, by, by law and not allowed to be used in law, possibly, I mean, possibly because it uh, wasn't very accurate, but also possibly because it seemed to threaten their function. Um, I mean, it is law itself that decides whether people are lying or not, and uh, do we really want this machine to do it? So a, a great deal of excitement about forensic science, but over the past hundred years or so, forensic science has, it's, it's been useful, um, it's, it's done some things, it's, it's been useful in many cases, but it, it hasn't really uh, completely changed the criminal justice system in the way that people in 1900 hoped that it might. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for this. Forensic science is not available in every case. Every case doesn't have the kinds of traces that you need to do an analysis. And, uh, and, and moreover, uh, if you don't have a suspect to match what you find at a crime scene, uh, it, 
it, it, you, it's difficult to search for one. You don't have uh, databases that you can search, or in fact, you do have databases, but they're kept on cards in uh, like the old card catalogs in the library in, in giant repositories of cards and, and you can't uh, search them. And this is why it's possible that the greatest forensic invention of the 20th century is not DNA profiling, as you might think, but modern computing technology, which allows you to search databases quickly, whether those databases are composed of, of, DNA, of genetic profiles or of fingerprints or of anything else. Um, and so certainly over the last, let's say, two decades, there has been major, major progress in forensic science. There's been new instrumentation, new machines, um, computerization, as I mentioned, is a huge benefit uh, in every area of forensic science. DNA profiling, which is certainly a, a revolutionary technology with, um, uh, which combines um, ext extremely precise powers of discrimination with an extremely robust technology. Um, and the development of, of new disciplines like entomology uh, and, and soil science, analyzing uh, the maggots found in dead bodies and soil samples uh, recovered from crime scenes. Uh, and again, these are the things that are, are show up on CSI and that give rise to the supposed CSI effect. Um, but uh, but it's, impo it's important to note that, if I can just go, go, go back for a second, um, that, well, I'm not sure what I was gonna note, but let's go on to the next. <laughs> Um, so, so uh, major advances in, in the past two decades in forensic science, but these advances have in some sense had uh, some unintended consequences. And uh, I'll just briefly allude to um, some of those unintended consequences and how they're talked about in, in, in these books. Um, one of them is that with the advent of DNA, there was a lot of debate over how to statistically express DNA matches, what to tell a jury, um, what numbers to give a jury about the relative likelihood that a certain person was the source of a particular DNA sample. And this debate, which was uh, colloquially known as the DNA Wars, and took place in the early 1990s when I was a graduate student, and it was in fact this debate that got me interested in this whole topic, um, was uh, this debate brought in a lot of high-level statisticians and molecular biologists who uh, really fought this out uh, as a high-level uh, scientific debate. And the result of that is that uh, you come out of that period with people having a sense that all of forensic science is inherently probabilistic, and not only inherently probabilistic, but for those of you who care, Bayes, uh, Bayesian probabilistic, um, and that all, for, all forensic evidence should really be thought about in Bayesian probabilistic terms, and it doesn't make any sense not to. You come out of that period around 1995, and the DNA debates get uh, were largely resolved, the, the fight has been had and, and some provisional agreement has been reached, and people turn around and realize, well, we really hashed out the numbers to most people's satisfaction for DNA. Nothing else in forensic science is expressed probabilistically. Um, no, nothing else in forensic science has had these debates. Uh, and nothing is, is, is expressed in terms of probability, so what are we going to do about that? And then you begin to ask the question of why don't you have statistics for other areas like fingerprint identification, handwriting identification, firearms and tool mark identification, all these techniques that have been around for decades and have uh, no data from which to make probabilistic statements um, and, and no tradition of, um, of debating the, the probabilistic issue. And, and so then you have, it gives rise to what my co-authors um, and I called in this book, Truth Machine, an inversion of credibility uh, between, you can, you can actually see in, in texts the period 1990 where, where 
DNA examiners come into court and say, we have this new technique. It's not quite as good as fingerprinting. We're not claiming we're as good as fingerprinting, but it's pretty good. Um, and it's like fingerprinting. So you should let us use it to the year 2000 where fingerprint examiners are coming, are, are coming into court saying, look, fingerprint identification, it's not as good as DNA. We're not claiming it's good as DNA, um, but it's like DNA and you should continue to allow it into court. So the, 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 the hierarchy between these techniques has, has com completely turned. And in a way, in, in, uh, by law enforcement in getting DNA through the court, courts, uh, in sense, generated this unintended negative consequences for some of the other uh, techniques. And just briefly, because this isn't really the topic today, um, what are some of those consequences for these techniques is essentially the discovery that they do not have these probabilistic statements to make and that they lack validation studies. It turns out fingerprints, uh, firearms and tool marks, handwriting to, to a large extent, bite mark identification, all of these, all, basically all of the not, pattern recognition techniques that are not DNA lack uh, validation studies. This generated a large debate uh, in which I uh, participated somewhat over the last 10 years or so and uh, has recently reached a watershed moment with the publication of this report by the National Academy of Sciences, which essentially says, yes, that's right. Um, no probabilistic basis, no validation studies, except for DNA. Um, we need to develop uh, a scientific knowledge base for these areas of forensic science. So uh, a number of people have noted the irony of at the very same, during the very same period that CSI is presenting forensic science as all powerful and, and omnipotent and glamorous, that you then have this report coming out saying that there may be problems with this, these techniques, or there may not be problems, but we don't have enough scientific data to know. And in addition, um, that's not all that this report says. It also says that there's inadequate funding, um, inadequate organizational structure. Um, and those things speak to the CSI effect as well, because CSI portrays forensic science as very well funded. Um, they have plenty of time to work on every case and so on. In fact, the CSI actors have gone before Congress and said, you know, real labs don't look like they do on TV and, and so on. So um, this is the forensic scientist preferred interpretation of this report, which is we need, which is they need more money. Uh, so, um, so what is, uh, so here's a kind of summary of uh, the CSI effect, and I mentioned that, um, I guess you, 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 you have a professor here, Melissa Littlefield, who talks a little bit about the origin of this in um, of many of these techniques in, in detective fiction. Um, Sherlock Holmes really did play a role in uh, generating uh, in generating a lot of ideas about forensic science. And just to remind all of you, Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character, right? Not a, not a real person, um, but a fictional character that Arthur Conan Doyle based upon one of his professors, uh, who, who a, medico, a professor of medical legal studies. So um, this is just to show there's all this interplay between um, Fiction, fiction and reality in this area. We could even have, have made this loop a little, we could go back to Conan Doyle's professor and then he writes Sherlock Holmes and then we develop forensic science. And then forensic science is interesting, right? So we have television shows about forensic science, both nonfiction shows and CSI. And then we have media saying, oh, these shows are impacting juries, right? They're having an effect on actual juries all right, and then we have um, uh, media sort of saying that there is this effect, even though we don't know if it's actually true. And 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 that so so I'm going to question whether the media claim that there's a CSI effect is in fact true. It may be fiction, um, but even if it is fiction, it then has an effect on reality because everybody reads that there is a CSI effect, so they think that there is one. And I, and I could continue to, to go around the spiral. Um, but so let's just talk a little bit about what people mean by the CSI effect. Um, it, it, it turns out that uh, 
if, if you look at media claims about the CSI effect, they mean all these different things. Uh, pe uh, people use, use the term to mean all kinds of different things. And I'll just briefly mention these. This, this top one is the really serious one, the one that um, people take the most seriously. It's the claim that jurors are acquitting in cases in which they would not have acquitted. They would have convicted the guy had no one ever created a show called CSI. Right? If CSI did not exist, uh, this guy would be convicted, but today he's being acquitted because someone created a show called CSI. And if that's true, that's actually a pretty serious thing. Um, w what a bummer to find out that our jury system is, is so flawed that it comes out with different outcomes depending on what's on primetime television. Um, this, this would be a very serious problem if, it, if indeed it is true. But it needs to be distinguished from what I'm calling the weak prosecutor's effect, which is simply the claim that because prosecutors believe that there is this effect, they are doing something about it. So they will do things about it, like put on a witness to explain why there's no fingerprints present uh, and things of that nature. At the same time, defense attorneys claim that there is a CSI effect, but it's pre precisely the opposite one. They say, hey, wake up, people. Here you have the most popular show on television portraying forensic scientists as honest, hardworking, good-looking, um, and, and, and scrupulously honest. That doesn't hurt the prosecution. That doesn't cause acquittals. It causes convictions. It boosts the credibility of the government's witnesses. It makes people more likely to trust them because they're portrayed favorably on TV. And there is indeed social science evidence that suggests when LA law was popular, people thought well of lawyers. And when ER was popular, they thought well of doctors. And when Watergate was happening, they thought well of journalists. Um, now, the producers of CSI say, oh yeah, there's a CSI effect. People are learning science from our show. Okay, we can dismiss that one. Uh, then there are people who notice, uh, we talked about this at lunch, students uh, switching to careers in forensic science because of the, uh, the dubious notion that it will lead to a glamorous and lucrative career uh, in, in forensic science. Um, which is uh, not true. Um, uh, some, there's also claims that criminals uh, are learning, uh, are adopting countermeasures because of what they learn about forensic evidence through the CSI program. There are some anecdotes that suggest this has happened. But again, I think that att attaches perhaps a little bit too much uh, forethought and intent to, to criminals, which may be true of some of them, but certainly not all of them. And then um, uh, a judge named John, Donald Shelton has made this important point that um, He's called it the tech effect. He said, well, look, um, things have happened. As I explained to you before, right, things have been happening in forensic science. There are actual improvements. And so we have to distinguish the effect of the TV show from the effect of what's really happening. Um, jurors who know that DNA exists and are taking that into account, that's not a problem, right? They should take into account that DNA exists. It does exist. It's true. What they should not take account, into account is made up techniques that, uh, that are just shown on television. But we need to separate the television effect from the effect of what's really happening. Um, and the victims effect, there are some reports of victims uh, expect there to be more forensic testing than there actually is. So, uh, as I said, the defense attorneys say this is a counterintuitive effect and that these guys are actually increasing trust in forensic scientists. Um, and we need to watch out for um, uh, what I call hypothesis swapping of people who take evidence of the weak prosecutor's effect um, and use it as evidence of the strong prosecutor's effect. So here's a report that said jurors are reaching the wrong conclusion because of CSI. And then you open the report and they say verdicts have not changed, right? Verdicts are the same. What's actually happening is that prosecutors are taking preemptive steps um, to tell juries why forensic evidence is not present in a particular case. Well, what's wrong with that? 
doesn't hurt anybody. The prosecutor has to explain why they don't have forensic evidence in a particular case. It's not clear that it's harmful. It's certainly not as harmful as jurors reaching a different conclusion because a TV show uh, uh, exists than they would otherwise. Uh, so how do we know whether this uh, effect exists? Um, these are the ways you can measure it. Um, the primar primary method has been through anecdote. Um, a, uh, somebody, uh, a case, somebody gets acquitted. Uh, the prosecutor goes to the newspaper. They say, um, uh, uh, the guy got acquitted. He should have been convicted. It must be the CSI effect. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure that you know, there's no other reason they could have acquitted. So this is not good social science evidence. Um, a, some social scientists have done surveys of people who work in the criminal justice system, which gives you evidence of the weak prosecutor of, of that people in the criminal justice system are being affected by CSI, but it doesn't show us that jurors are. There are surveys of jurors that show little or no effect. There are psychological experiments on college students, like many of you, where you have a mock jury. Um, these are a, uh, a, an imperfect means of measuring the effect, but, but it's one way of doing it. Uh, and those have found either no effect or maybe a small defendant's effect, some of these studies, not the prosecutor's effect that we talked about before. Um, one thing I've been interested in is acquittal rate measures, actually trying to see if something's happening in the acquittal rate that we could blame on CSI. And just to uh, briefly look at this, here's, here's the first study which just looks at the acquittal rate in federal trials, 1945 to 2005. Um, what we see is a long, slow, Decline in acquittals, fewer and fewer acquittals over time. Here's here's around when CSI comes on, and so um, no no jump in acquittals clearly, and in fact, kind of a steep drop off that actually that keep that keeps going uh, after after 2005. Here's a closer snapshot of the more recent years, again with CSI being here. So no no real discernible jump. Here's a. Canadian study, uh, a guy named Loeffler also did a study for four large states, found, found no CSI effect. Here's, um, here's a Canadian study. These are uh, the rate of convictions, not acquittals. So you say, wait, wait, it's, it's true. Um, convictions are going down, acquittals are going up after the year 2000. But DuPont argues that, well, yeah, they're going, convictions are going down, but they were already going down already, right? And they're going down at basically the same the same rate, so um, he's, he doesn't think CSI has changed anything. Um, here, here's, here's the next study, um, and uh, these are acquittal rates in a variety of states and aggregate. Um, it, it turns out, I'm not really a statistical person, but it turns out very difficult to interpret uh, longitudinal time series data like this, but um, but it's hard to really tell what's going on. Uh, here's the year that CSI comes on. Of course, we don't know that the effect takes place immediately. It might have a lag. But yeah, it does go up. The acquittal rate got, does go up a little bit after CSI comes on, but then it goes back down. And anyway, it was, go, it was going up beforehand, right? And in fact, the big jump is, is really from here to here. Um, not so much from here to here. So not, not really strong evidence that there's some kind of uh, dramatic rise in acquittals in the United States. More data. Um, and yet, if you look at the media characterizations of this effect, the one you hear about is what I'm calling the strong prosecutor's effect. That's the one that's in the media, that juries are acquitting in cases where they would have convicted had no one uh, made a show called CSI. Um, and so here's the number of mentions of the various types of effects. And here is the, the number of mentions with the number of expressions of doubt. So very little doubt about, this is just meant to illustrate that in the media, they don't say, people are saying there might be a CSI effect, but social scientists aren't sure. They're saying there is a CSI effect, big problem, big social problem, we need to do something about it. 
Uh, where have we heard this before? Has there ever been an episode in which uh, the media said that there was a big problem in our legal system involving juries and um, there wasn't really all that much strong social scientific evidence that there is such a problem? Well, yeah, uh, it was an episode called The Litigation Explosion, or it may still be an episode, because we might still be in it, um, in which people said there's a crisis in American law. Um, we have, uh, this was the hyperlexis uh, thing that I talked about before. Uh, the American, America is a litigious society. We have too many lawyers. We have too many lawsuits. We have uh, more lawyers per capita than any other um, comparable nation. People are suing over um, having McDonald's coffee spilled on them. You've heard, you remember this stuff? Um, and this is the cause of our national decline. Right? We've become a, a, a nation of whiners um, who, uh, who are, are enculturated to, to play the victim and to be compensated for everything bad that happens to them as opposed to our frontier ancestors who sucked it up and were rugged and dealt with adversity not by suing but by picking themselves up and uh, building the country. Right. This is uh, kind of the, the discourse that went on. And in that case, um, also, there was no evidence that there was more litigation than there used to be, uh, or that America is more litigious than comparable nations. I think Japan is actually more litigious than uh, the US is. Uh, and uh, largely supported by anecdote, principally the McDonald's coffee case. Uh, which a number of legal scholars have, have looked at uh, much more closely than the media reports did. And in fact, you know, in the McDonald's coffee case, that was a person who suffered a very, very serious injury and you know, spent um, a couple weeks in, in the hospital. And McDonald's had been warned about this and had deliberately decided not to change the temperature of their coffee. So there's more to that case than uh, usually meet, met the eye. Um, and uh, so, so again, a lack of social scientific evidence supporting this claim. So uh, let's just, just talk a, a, a little bit about, uh, I don't want to take too much time, um, what it is that supposedly is wrong with CSI. What is it that CSI is distorting? CSI is commonly said it distorts reality. Uh, there's a thing called reality and then CSI distorts it and gives us some other thing. And so people say it's fake. It gives us false reality. It's fake TV. Um, and I don't know if you can read that headline up there. Um, it says fake TV, which is an interesting notion in itself, right? What is fake TV as opposed to what reality TV, which is not reality? I don't know. Uh, so, so some of the claims, that, the, the odd thing about the CSI effect is that, that, that surprises me is that you know, it actually suggests that American people don't know that it's a fictional television show, that they actually need to be informed of this, that they actually think that this is some sort of reality television show. And so you think, see things that people say jurors don't know, can't tell real life from entertainment. When the actors play agents on television, they are just acting. Uh, the, the Maricopa County's attorney has made it a policy to question potential jurors to see whether they, they know such depictions are not reality. Now, I don't think I have such an optimistic view of the education level of the American people. I know there are problems uh, with scientific literacy and education, but I'm not that convinced that that many people don't know that CSI is a drama as opposed to a, a documentary. Um, in fact, some of uh, the DA of LA, the Los Angeles district attorney called the jury stoop, jurors stupid when they acquitted an actor uh, named Robert Blake who played Beretta, who, which was also a crime drama before CSI, um, for supposedly murdering his wife. Uh, some of the language uh, calls jurors junkies, uses the language of addiction to describe jurors. So jurors are crime show junkies. They're addicted to CSI. They're hooked on forensic science. They're obsessed 
with forensic science. Um, and again, this, uh, the prose county prosecutor in Phoenix has actually uh, su suggested that, uh, uh, first of all, he's claimed there's a very serious problem, very serious CSI effect. He's called on CBS to put a disclaimer on the show, and he said, and what might also be nice is if you did a show about the CSI effect. So he's, so he's pitching a show to the, uh, to the producers, and he says you should have a show in which um, there's a jury foreman who's, I can't read the, uh, who's addicted to CSI, and then there's a young, young inexperienced jurors who, who are swayed by him, and they let someone go, and just let's pick child molestation as the crime um, to, to really bring the point home. Uh, what other things does CSI do wrong? Well, it's been pointed out that CSI is deceptive about the role of, um, of, of forensic scientists. It's uh, crime scene technicians carry guns, they make arrests, they get to go confront the suspect, they get to go question the suspect. That, of course, does not happen for real forensic scientists who are largely civilians. They're not sworn police officers. They don't have power of arrest. They're not permitted to, to carry guns. But if the characters on CSI were like that, the show would be boring, right? So they, they would not be able to, so they have to go be able to arrest the people and engage in chases or else, um, or else the show would not exist. And of course, you know, to create CSI in the first place, the producers had to convince um, CBS that, that the show would not be boring, that, that making a show about science was not going to be boring. Uh, the show portrays forensic scientists as generalists rather than specialists. They all do all the techniques, they know all the techniques, they use all the instruments, right? That's not, uh, that's not generally true in crime labs. They, they tend to be specialized in, 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 one, uh, in one area. Uh, time. Now, this is a really odd one. Lots and lots of media complaints about the CSI effect suggest that it conveys the notion that uh, DNA tests take 15 minutes, that crimes are solved in 40 minutes, and so on and so forth. But, th but this is really strange. I mean, CSI is like any other television show. It takes 40 minutes of your time while you're sitting on the couch watching it, but it doesn't depict 40 minutes of time, right? They're, they're, this is a convention of television and of movies, right? Uh, they're, when they cut, time in the fictional story, days, weeks, years can pass, and then they come back to it. Um, in fact, there is a show that supposedly takes place in real time. It's called 24, but CSI does not do that. So it's not actually suggesting that these tests take 40 minutes, and it's strange that um, people keep saying that it does. Um, Nonetheless, it, it is sort of, and now there are articles about the 24 effect, which is supposedly at the effect of the show in 24 in normalizing torture and making torture seem okay. Um, but certainly it does portray um, DNA tests as easier to conduct, as cheaper, as more common than apparently they actually are. So, um, so you know, there is a le legitimate complaint that it suggests that uh, forensic scientists just simply order uh, any forensic test they want to at any time if it'll help the case, that forensic scientists work one case at a time and do everything they need to do to solve that case without um, other cases impinging on their time, which of course is not true. Um, most of them manage crushing caseloads and have massive backlogs. Um, in fact, a big story in forensic science is the massive backlogs in rape, in untested rape kits that are simply sitting there and not being tested because uh, they, we don't have the budget or the, the, uh, or the resources to have them tested. Um, and then occasionally a technique, uh, complaints of fictional techniques. Now, now not all, certainly most of the stuff on, for, on, on CSI appears to be uh, a real science, although it may not exist in every laboratory. But there are some things that are just simply made up, like the sampling of air in a room after someone has been there to determine their perfume. Can't really do that. Uh, or everybody's favorite, the pouring of caulk into a knife wound to make a mold of the knife. <laughs> no, right? So, um, so uh, and some have estimated, well, 40% of the techniques are, are fictional. Again, capacity, CSI makes it look like 
uh, easy to run tests, laboratories are well equipped and so on, that's uh, far from true. Um, and glamour, right? Um, CSI portrays uh, the profession of forensic science as a glamorous profession where your coworkers will be quirky lab technicians and maybe even a saucy former stripper. Um, the detectives are often good looking and invariably heroic, um, never convict the wrong person, drive around in a Hummer, wear leather pants apparently, um, and bathe the entire lab in this mysterious blue light, which uh, uh, forensic sci science labs gen generally have fluorescent light, um, dull institutional fluorescent lighting, um, that it's exciting, again, because you get to chase down the criminal after you finish doing the science, um, but in fact, forensic scientists re report that uh, forensic work is actually very tedious, and here's one for all of you college students out here. Forensic biology is very repetitive, and academic research is a lot more exciting, so stay in academics and pursue your graduate degree, and, and don't get sucked away by forensic science. Um, and 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 another I issue close to um, uh, my heart as someone in science and technology studies is the non-ambiguity of evidence. The evidence always produces a single interpretation, a single clear answer. Um, there's one way to interpret it, and it solves the crime. Um, and in fact, uh, first of all, science is generally not that way. Scientific data generally requires interpretation to make sense of it, and there are often multiple t interpretations that are, as we say in science studies, theory-laden, that depend somewhat on, on what theory you have. And in, a, in forensic science, in real cases, often um, uh, the interpretation of the evidence is not entirely clear. One of my colleagues, Professor Bill Thompson, worked on a fascinating case. We talk about it in the, in the book, Truth Machine, where uh, the uh, who did a crime depended on uh, whether the DNA found in the sweat in a, hat, a band of a baseball hat had been contributed by two people or by three people. So were there th did three people wear this hat or two people wear this hat. Uh, if it was two, the defendants were guilty. There was evidence the defendants were guilty. If it was three, there was evidence that, that they were not. And, and so it depended on, on so there were multiple interpretations of, of this evidence. Um, so here's, here's a, a moment where um, the CSI effect becomes kind of um, science and technology studies -y. They say, oh, you know, um, it portrays science as unambiguous, whereas in fact, um, it's subject to interpretation. Um, one of the funniest uh, uh, th things that speaks to this, I don't know if, you're, if you've studied postmodernism yet, but uh, here, here's a quotation from a CSI producer in the New York Times where he says, the show's uh, in some ways postmodern. It provides a... Uh, it, it provides a, a clear answer um, it provides a definite and final answer, right? Um, we don't have situational ethics. Um, we say who did it and how they did it, and people love that, cl that closure. So for the undergraduates in, in the audience, if you've um, taken any courses which teach what postmodernism is, of course they probably told you that nobody knows what postmodernism is, that it's indefinable, but to the extent that it's definable, it means exactly the opposite of this, <laughs> right? Which is uh, there are no definite answers, there are no clear answers, everything is ambiguous and all that is solid melts into air. Um, so it's interesting that this CSI producer gets postmodernism completely wrong and the New York Times allows them to do so. Um, but in fact, it raises a sort of more interesting point, which is that um, CSI is sort of critiqued for being too modern, for not being postmodern about science. Uh, it adheres to the maximum that people lie, but evidence never does. Um, and the, the criminologist Tom Lo Nolan has written a nice article pointing out the courts, judges, and trials are unnecessary and invisible in CSI. You never see them because there's no need to have a trial because, you know, and this is a big contrast with law and order where usually the truth comes out at the trial. It's in the trial you have that final plot twist. Um, that, that tells you, you know, what, what actually happened. Um, you don't need any of that in CSI because the scientific evidence ends the process um, and, and the suspect confesses. 
All right, we can skip, skip that. Um, we can skip that. So, uh, well, maybe we shouldn't skip it. Um, so, uh, one thing this impinges upon is, uh, is what's called in trials the burden of proof. Uh, People have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That's considered to be a very high burden of proof, a very high burden to meet. And prosecutors have begun in trials to say, hey, the, the, the standard here is only beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not the CSI standard. And they've made up this term, the CSI standard or the television standard. So here's a closing uh, from, from a prosecutor talking about that. Um, and, and the court was very displeased with that closing. They said, the prosecutor's confusing and disjointed attempt to compare fictional television standards of proof um, as he chose to perceive them with actual constitutional standards denigrated the reasonable doubt standard and incorrectly stated the law. You can't denigrate the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. Um, that's unconstitutional. And so uh, this, this conviction was, uh, should have been overturned, except um, it was harmless. So. Um, so not overturned, but this whole notion that, uh, and, and this is what's going to bring me to my conclusion, this whole notion that, uh, that the CSI has somehow distorted the burden of proof is kind of strange. I mean, the burden of proof is the burden of proof, no matter what's on television, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, and it's not clear how CSI changes it. But even more to the point, it maybe gives us a clue to what is really going on when we talk about the CSI effect. Because it's important to note that the beyond a reasonable doubt standard dates from the 18th century England, in which it was thought to be a lowering of the burden of proof. And in fact, the burden of proof was higher before the beyond a reasonable doubt standard, affectionately known as BART, came along. Um, it, it was thought that jurors had to be absolutely certain that someone was guilty before they could convict them. And this was called mathematical certainty. And it was said, okay, we don't need, no longer do we need mathematical certainty, we need just moral certainty, just beyond a reasonable doubt. So, the reason, so it was lowered. Now this is interesting because I was trying to allude to this in some of the earlier slides, we don't really talk about mathematical certainty very much anymore. You don't hear, uh, hear the term very much. Practicing scientists don't tend to talk about mathematical certainty, um, except to say uh, we're not talking about mathematical certainty. Um, but, this, but nonetheless, you can I begin to see a parallel between the way we're talking about CSI now and this discourse of worry about we need lower proof in law than they need in mathematics and in science, that law has to have, um, has to have a lower proof. And this suggests to me that perhaps what's going on is a certain anxiety about um, how we're going to actually prove truth in law when things like DNA exist. When science is saying that everything is probabilistic and uh, science is able to quantify its uncertainty in a way that law is not. It's able to use data to, to estimate its uncertainty. And moreover, you have forensic techniques like DNA that have very, uh, very high probability, very, very low probability numbers attached to them. You have DNA claims that say um, the, the, the frequency of this particular genetic profile that was found at the crime scene and also is found in the defendant is, is, appears in the human population once in a trillion times. Um, if that's true, and if you accept that claim, that's a very, very strong claim. Uh, and it's a, it's a claim that no kind of non-scientific evidence could seem to be able to compete with. So perhaps what's going on with the CSI effect is, uh, is a anxiety in the legal profession about uh, the power of science to prove things in a way that law thinks it may not be able to. And so, you know, thus, to go back to the litigation explosion, it is, like the litigation explosion, an expression of distrust in the jury system, and thus, in some sense, of democracy. Um, it is amazing, remember, that this 
the people are claiming that juries are actually reaching different outcomes because of a TV show, that they're stupid, um, and that they don't know fictional television from documentaries. But unlike the litigation explosion, it may also be an expression of legal anxiety about whether people will trust law to produce truth um, as well as science. And the answer is they better trust law to produce truth because now and for the foreseeable future, it's not all cases that lend themselves to scientific evidence and that have scientific evidence available. So there will always be cases in which we do not have science and we will have to use other means, witnesses and so on, um, to try to get at truth. So with that, let me end and I'm happy to take any questions. And thank you. Uh, the question was, how hard is it to get DNA evidence for trial for the prosecution or the defense? Um, you know, it depends on the crime and whether it's, it's, it's left there, and it depends on the capabilities of, <laughs> well, it depends on the capabilities of the laboratory. Um, rape is obviously a good crime because often there is the depositing of material containing DNA unless condoms are used. and um, so. You know, I recently saw a paper which still suggested that the use of DNA continues to be, you know, surprisingly low. I think it was talking 10, 20 percent of, of cases in which it was applicable. Um, there are many, and, and remember, we have very fragmented law enforcement in the United States. It's not just a federal system. It's local counties and municipalities. Um, there was some re research not that long ago, survey research of, um, of county law enforcement. You know, there's many labs out there that have never requested a DNA test ever um, that, you know, it's not clear they know that <laughs> It exists. Um, uh, well, uh, it's you. You know, this is actually one of the problems pointed out by um, by the report. Uh, you know, it's the prosecution that generates evidence in a criminal case. Um, the the lab work tends to be done by. Uh, Laboratory, by forensic laboratories that tend to be located in law enforcement agencies. And uh, this is the, one of the number one reform proposal made in that National Academy of Sciences report is take, is crime laboratories are science, their allegiance should be to science and to truth, take them out of the law enforcement agency, it's a biasing effect, have them be neutral agencies. Um, that would report equally to defense and prosecution alike. Um, it's not clear how that's going to work. The British privatized their agency, which is called Forensic Science Service. It's a for-profit corporation. Now there's problems with making your forensic science a for-profit corporation whose largest and essentially only client is the government. Uh, so it's not clear that that's all that different than the the system that, that we have. But there are efforts to, uh, or there are proposals to take, take law enforcement, uh, take it out of um, law enforcement. In Orange County, California, where I come from, they've now relocated the DNA lab from the sheriff's office, which is where it is most places, to the prosecutor's office. It's controlled by the prosecutor, which I view as even worse. <laughs> Um, because it's not even a law enforcement agent, it's, you know, a litigant in the case. And the prosecutor's office is doing a program unique in the country uh, called Spit and Acquit, which is uh, if you're arrested for a low-level crime, a traffic violation, disorderly conduct, or something like that, they say, we'll drop the charges against you if you'll just spit on this piece of paper and allow us to add your DNA profile to our database because we want your profile more than we want to convict you of this petty crime. Uh, and it's kind of a tough choice <laughs> for, 
for, for people faced with this. Some, sometimes they don't, haven't even gotten a lawyer yet, and it's a pretty tempting offer. This was really interesting, and I want to thank you a lot. There, I mean, I feel like you could stay for hours and hours, and we wouldn't get through it all. But um, I'm I sure work a, lot a lot of you felt that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I work a lot with uh, media and medicine. And there, like, as in law, you have this very well-developed institution that thinks very well of itself and has put a lot of effort into controlling almost every aspect of its performance or practices or whatever. And so if you look at journals like New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association, over the years, you see exactly the same concerns. And you see even the Dr. Welby effect the MASH effect, the ER effect, mm -hmm. the et cetera, et cetera. And I think that um, one of the things that's going on in addition to the things that you said here is, is the um, anxiety by the, by the people invested in that institution uh, where that information, where this other information is coming from, right? It's not just that it's media, although that's definitely part of it. It's television radio, it's films, but it's, it's that it's out of their control, what people are watching. There's no way they can control that. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that also. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I can talk about the media angle, but I, you know, one, one thing it does make me think of is that there are, are a lot of parallels between what's going on in forensic science and what's going on in medicine because medicine is also an area that um, for a long time has been resisting the systematic collection of data uh, and instead has relied on clinical knowledge that you know, it's the knowledge of the cl clinician to know what's wrong and we never check that or measure how often we're right, we just know it. And now you have this movement called evidence-based medicine to which most people reply, you mean it wasn't evidence-based before? Uh, and, and it wasn't. And so, and now you have this uh, trend of all these evidence. So we have in, in my department at UC Irvine, we have a new center for evidence-based corrections. Uh, which again, so they weren't evidence-based before, we just did what we thought was, was right. And, and I've written a piece called Evidence-Based Evidence, uh, <laughs> suggesting that we need forensic evidence to actually be evidence-based. But there are a lot of similarities in, in terms of thinking that clinical knowledge um, is okay absent the kind of systematic collection of, of, validation, of, of validation data. Now it's a little different I think when a doctor wants to do that, who's been to medical school and been board certified, then when a police officer who was trained through on the job training to investigate arsons wants to do it. Um, but, but still, it's kind of similar. There actually is another, another interesting parallel. Um, going back to your idea about what the law produces is the truth. I mean, so someone is guilty is found guilty, they're guilty. And a diagnosis actually very often works that way in medicine. And in fact, someone coming up with a diagnosis and putting it into a chart, not to mention now where it generates payments and all kinds of stuff, is very hard to dislodge. I feel like it's got to be a really good question after this young man ran all the way up the <laughs> stairs in order to hand me a microphone. Um, I, I, I too found this to be really helpful and uh, really compelling in a lot of respects. Uh, one question that I have has to do with the way in which uh, the project um, is organized around a fictional program and real life, that is to say, real social institutions. And so, and your occasional disclaimers at one point about those students who are familiar or not familiar with something called postmodernist theory, blah, blah, blah. 
So uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, let's say, um, a kind of the way in which, I know this isn't your area, but it's sort of the way in which television is in this moment of a kind of documentarist regime uh, in which, and I'm, I mean, reality TV, I don't know if, if it's just, if it's an adequate description of everything that might sort of fall into it. But I'm thinking particularly of shows like To Catch a Predator or um, the producers of that show that some of them that were involved in, uh, The Wanted. Um, and to think about, let's say, sort of technical linkages, institutional linkages between television production and forensics or uh, criminology, that is to say, between publicly funded uh, institutions and private um, commercial uh, programs of crime fighting that in some ways work in tandem with one another. Right? And I don't think, and I raise that, those examples or the wanted because they employ professional, um, I don't know that they would be forensic experts, but they are uh, people who have a background in some sort of professional uh, criminological um, activity. So uh, it seems to me that there is now some kind of important um, connection that one might talk about beside just is it real or is it fiction, right? And is, is it a kind of blurring of the real or the fictional or is it that jurors come into the, the, the jury room with a kind of uh, myth that they've developed through TV about forensics, right? Is there, can we talk about a kind of, in these times, a kind of linkage between these two institutions, right, and their production of documents, their production of surveillance, um, uh, and so on. I, I, I hope that I'm being clear. It's maybe as big a question as your project is, too. But. Well, um, yeah, as you say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a media studies person, and I don't know if I can do justice, quite, quite as much justice to your question as, 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 as you've already done, but certainly it, it, it didn't escape my notice that the sort of delicious irony of, um, of this phenomenon happening in, I mean, of people talking about fake TV in this era of reality TV, um, as, as you suggest, the, you know, it's becoming increasingly blurred, and there now are all these fictional television programs that have a documentary feel, like The Office or, some, or something like that. And CSI, oddly, isn't even that, right? I mean, it, 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 it's like a television, a primetime television drama in the classic sense that doesn't look real in, in that sense at all. Um, in terms of institutional connections, I mean, there's some interesting prehistory to this where uh, the National District Attorneys Association, which is a national organization of prosecutors, early on said, hey, this is great. There's this new TV show that's really going to help us. Uh, and in fact, one of the stars is the son of a prosecutor, the George Eads, who's one of those good-looking guys. Um, it, it's just, and they said, you know, we should try to figure out ways to use this TV show to kind of promote our agenda, essentially. Uh, and within a year, someone, and I haven't been able to trace how it happened, and I don't think I'm going to be able to, uh, somehow that turned and somebody decided or some, or it just happened, but somehow the message got completely turned on its head. Let's claim that actually this show is bad for us. Let's claim this show hurts us. Uh, and we are actually being 
uh, hampered by the existence of this show. We fa you know, so what's going on here, if it wasn't clear, is that both prosecutors and defense attorneys are talking to the media to claim that they face an unlevel playing field in the courtroom. And prosecutors are saying to the media, we can't do our jobs anymore because of that TV show. And defense attorneys are saying, we can't do our jobs because of that TV show. Although prosecutors are doing a much better job of, of, of getting the message out there. But that's an actual connection between a sort of prosecutor's institution and, um, and the television show. And of course, there are other connections too. There are people who have gone from forensic science uh, to be consultants for the show and for, for the spin-off shows and the imitator shows as well. In fact, that, that was a definition of the CSI effect I didn't mention, right? The, the luring of practicing forensic scientists to careers in Hollywood uh, away from, from their jobs. Uh, what would you say about, um, like, assuming the CSI effect for uh, just the false techniques and criminals trying to come up with uh, countermeasures, if they're coming up with countermeasures to the fictional techniques, uh, isn't that, like, a good thing? I mean, just please comment on this. This one I, f I find pretty confusing one way or another. Because if so, they're coming up. So the, 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 fic, the countermeasures were meant to be things that prosecutors do to counteract mm -hmm. the CSI effect. And the, the most famous one is negative evidence testimony. So to prevent the defense attorney from getting up there and saying, hey, they've got CSI. I've seen it on TV. They, if, if my client really was there, they would have his DNA. And they haven't put on any DNA evidence, so he must not have been there. Right? You bring up the DNA analyst and say, no. Um, you know, we looked for DNA and we, you know, we didn't find it, but that doesn't mean anything because often you don't get recoverable traces and the, te you know, the technology isn't as great as you might think it is. And so there's nothing. He could have been there even though we didn't find DNA. So um, th that's uh, what I'm referring to by countermeasures. Uh, yeah, that's what I was talking about. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, and so if they use countermeasures for fictional techniques? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I better not stab this guy because they'll pour caulk in the wound. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I hadn't thought of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, oh, no. I better not wear cologne because <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to erase all my scent before I go and, and, and do, this, do this crime. Um, you know, people do think that planting is going, you know, as the DNA technology gets more and more robust, planting is going to become more and more of an issue, both by criminals and by law enforcement. Planting, planting of DNA samples. Um, yeah, 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 that, that's right, or, um, uh, yeah, but if you want kind of stronger evidence, that might be one, one way of doing it, right, so, um, there are studies that you can go to the bus stop and scrape DNA off the bench, um, amp do PCR and amplify it up. Uh, put it in a perfume bottle, spray it around uh, a room, and it that will be the profile that shows up, but not the one of the people who were there recently. So that, that would be one way for people to do it. Okay, so last question is up there. Um, hi. So um, you brought up an interesting question when you said, uh, so should people trust the law or science to reveal the truth? So um, I took a law class during the summer. I'm actually a student in electrical engineering, but took a law class and uh, the professor said, you know, many people say law is so cut and dry, that's why we have Supreme Court cases that come out 5-4, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so you brought up a few interesting points and you said that um, science was you know, more of an open inquiry where law, you have to decide things in a finite period. Um, while I agree with you on the fact that, yeah, and if there's a case, we decide relatively fast, but uh, precedence changed so much, um, and we find out things are not the same 100 years later, and people are even pardoned post but anyway, um, so with regards to 
Um, you, you mentioned the Orange County DA will, if you voluntarily provide a DNA sample, or they will acquit you with the probably, I guess, the hopes of getting you the next time you commit a crime. Um, so what's a little disturbing to me is, uh, I, I don't know, but maybe you can help me out. In terms of before you decide whether um, the prosecutor indicts you or not, I mean, do they ever offer you the fact, oh, if you take a DNA test and it comes clean, we may not indict you, or if you take a lie detector test and it doesn't, you know, you pass it, we may not indict you. Um, with the advances in technology, uh, especially in, say, MRI brain, computer interaction, um, what happens when one day we say, well, you know, if you take an M, if we do an MRI and, or I guess a CAT scan and we uh, see that whatever f lobes in your brain aren't lighting up that you're probably telling the truth, um, well, what do you do then? I mean, are you, you're sort of boxed in because there's going to be a presumption of guilt if you don't um, do certain things and that could lead to an indictment or so forth. Well, um, so you're a law student, is no, that? No, oh, um, yeah. I don't. Th I don't think you can be compelled to take a polygraph or or even a more modern lie detection technique because the law is so distrustful of the polygraph. Some defendants may want to take it voluntarily to try to convince the police. Yeah, that's that's what I meant. So, um, you know, if you say you don't want to take it voluntarily, then they may have a reason to indict you. you know. Yeah, they may, but I, I, you know, I, I, I don't view that as a major problem yet with, uh, with the polygraph. Uh, and then with DNA, you know, if they have probable cause, they can get a warrant to get a DNA sample from you. Um, and, you know, that I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Um, you know, an interesting question, I think, as, uh, as, as you raised, is um, all of this may, be be may make law enforcement better and, and more reliable. Um, that having more forensics in it um, may be more trustworthy than old-fashioned uh, investigations and interrogations uh, and use of informants and, and so on. So, you know, all of this may, may be to the good. It's, it's hard to know. All right, thanks. All right, thanks.